So very good afternoon, everyone. Hope you are doing well. Welcome to my lecture number eight or three. Uh, this is the further continuation for the exam lab questions. This is part two, where I'll be covering question number twenty six to thirty five. Uh, which is a series of 200 questions uh, for the exam labs. These are extremely important set of exams for the specialty exam and the European board exam. And every year, uh, several questions and themes are repeated from the exam lab uh, set of questions. So this is the exam lab uh, set of questions and uh, they're very, very popular. And uh, if you are one of my paid subscribers, you must have uh, listened to the full session of the 25 questions, uh, which I had done uh, a few months ago. So this is a further continuation to it. And we'll start with question number 26. So here we have a 58 year old man who is presently with tiredness and breathlessness. He has been treated for type two diabetes and hypertension for the past 10 years. He was free of any complications. His current medications include an ACE inhibitor, uh, which is taking ramipril at the dose of 10 mg per day, rosuvastatin 10 mg, metformin 500 mg three times a day, dapagliflozin 10 mg once a day, and a GLP-1 exit type 10 microgram twice daily. On examination, his BMI is in the obese range, uh, 36 kg per meter square, and these were a set of labs. His hemoglobin was 93, definitely low. MCV 110, it's in the higher range. White cell count is 3.6, lower end. Platelet count 140 at the lower end. Reticulocyte count 0.5%, serum ferritin 250, which is in the good range. Serum vitamin B12 also was done, which was pretty low at 40 nanogram per liter. And serum polyte in the normal range as well at 3 gram per liter. So which of the medication is most likely to be contributing to his anemia? Is it the DAPA, is it exenatide, is it metformin, or is it lamipril, or is it rosuvastatin? So obviously from the lab parameters and his uh, symptoms, he's anemic, and uh, the lab picture is clearly suggestive of vitamin B12 deficiency. So the correct answer is metformin. So vitamin B12 is derived primarily from the consumed animal proteins, Upon digestion uh, of these proteins, gastric parietal cells produce intrinsic factor, which then attaches to the vitamin B12 and assists in its transport to the small bowel. In the small bowel, specifically the terminal ileum, vitamin B12 and intrinsic factor are cleaved from each other. In the terminal ileum, calcium plays a vital role in assisting the transportation and storage of vitamin B12 in the liver. And long-term metformin usage actually impairs the ability of this calcium to carry out this role thus leading to vitamin B12 deficiency in people with type 2 diabetes. So that's the pathophysiology, how it causes vitamin B12 deficiency. Question number 27, we have a 26 year old man with type 1 diabetes, attended a carbohydrate counting course, very commonly in the UK we have the Daphne courses, how to facilitate a tighter glucose control. He was found to have estimated his carbohydrate ratio at 1 is to 10, so basically one unit will cover for 10 grams of carbohydrates and correction doses were found out to be at, estimated to be at one unit will drop down his blood glucose by 3 millimole per liter. So he planned to eat a meal now containing 50 grams of carbohydrate. His pre-meal blood glucose was found to be 16 millimole per liter with a target blood glucose at pre-meal being 7 millimole per liter. So how many units of the bolus insulin should he administer? Should it be two, should it be four, should it be six, should it be eight, or should it be 10? So again, go through the question. This carbohydrate ratio is one is to 10. This correction dose is one to three. He's going to eat a 50 gram of carbohydrate meal. And his pre-meal glucose is currently at 16 with a target of seven. So one unit will give him 10 grams of carbohydrate. We know we'll cover the 10 grams of carbohydrate. We know that five units uh, will be then covering the 50 gram of carbohydrate, which is going to intake. If one unit is reducing the blood glucose by three millimole, as was his correction factor, and if his pre-meal target is seven millimole per liter, his current blood glucose was found to be 16. So he's nine millimole above the target. So the correction dose maybe will be three. So you add that three to the five units, which are going to cover for the carbohydrates. So the correct answer it is a, the D option, which is eight units. Now, 
This is uh, the insulin to carb ratio and the correction factor calculations, which are being practiced now in the Daphne program. Uh, extremely important set of slides for the exams. Again, uh, previously also many questions have been asked in the previous attempts from this particular slide. Uh, so insulin to carbohydrate ratio is nothing but the amount of insulin required for a fixed amount of carbohydrate, usually is 10 grams as was for this patient. A total of 10 grams of carbohydrate is also referred to as CP, commonly we call it CP, or the carbohydrate portion in Daphne. This can also be expressed as the number of grams of carbohydrate required to balance one unit of insulin. Example, if, for example, it can be 10 grams per unit or 8 grams per unit. A common starting point for a normal weighted adult is one unit for 10 grams of carb. Now, what is the rule of 400? So a simple rule to calculate the insulin carb ratio is to divide by the 400 by the total daily dose the patient is on. So for example, if the patient is on a total daily dose of 40 units, now this total daily dose is basically a sum total of the basal as well as the bolus insulin. Then the ratio will be simply 400 divided by 40, which will be 10 grams per unit. So one unit will cover for 10 grams of carbohydrate. Suppose if the patient's total daily dose was 80 units, then the insulin carbohydrate ratio will be 400 by 80, which will be five grams per unit. This should be further tested by checking the blood glucose to our post meal. If these are above the target, usually set for less than 10 millimol per liter, then this uh, ratio can be adjusted further. What about insulin sensitivity or what we call as a correction factor? This is the degree to which one unit of the insulin will drop the blood glucose. A common starting point is again one unit will drop by three millimol. Another way to calculate this is 120 divided the, by the total daily dose. So if the total daily dose is 40, it will be 120 divided by 40, then it will be 3 millivolt per liter. So this is how we calculate insulin carbohydrate ratio and insulin sensitivity in clinical practice. Question number 28, 53-year-old man with history of sweats and tremors was found for abnormal thyroid functions and a small diffuse goiter. He was treated with carbinosol, so he's already on antithyroid drugs, but he developed a sore throat after three weeks into the therapy. Investigation showed Hemoglobin 150, but white cell count, which has dropped to 2. Neutrophil count, which is pretty low at 0 0.4. Uh, TSH continues to be suppressed, but it's still hyperthyroid. T4 is continuing to be high, still hyperthyroid. And his uh, TSH receptor antibody is positive indicate of the diagnosis of Graves disease. So he is definitely developing neutropenia. And that's why the carbamazole was stopped. His sore throat resolved, and then the full blood count normalized. What will be the next appropriate step in the management? Should we go for early partial therapy? Should we go for early radioactive iodine therapy? Should we restart carbamazole at a lower dose? Should we switch to PTU or should we treat with Lugol's iodine for this patient? Correct answer is look for early radioactive iodine therapy as a definitive form of treatment in this patient. A granulocytosis represents a potentially fatal but rare side effect of antithyroid drugs. This occurs in 0.1 to 0.5% of the patients. Remember this percentage, very commonly asked in the exams. It is less frequent with carbamazole than with PTU, but there is always cross-reactivity between the two drugs, and that's why one drug should never be substituted for the other drug if this reaction has already been uh, diagnosed or uh, happened. So that's something to keep in mind. So patients should go for early radioactive iodine therapy. Question number 29, a 26-year-old uh, physiologist was seen in the diabetes outpatient clinic. She had type 1 diabetes for nine months, treated with sub -Q insulin. She asked what symptoms of hypoglycemia she may experience. So 26 year old with nine months history of diabetes, she's quite likely maybe she's LADA. Uh, she's on already treatment with uh, the separate insulin and she was asking about the symptoms of hypoglycemia that she may experience. In what order are the responses to hypoglycemia most likely to occur as the blood glucose falls? Is it A, does it autonomic happen first? Symptoms, then counter-regulatory hormones, then neuroglycopenia. Is it B, autonomic neuroglycopenia, counter-regulatory hormones? Is it C, counter-regulatory hormones, autonomic neuroglycopenia? Is it D, counter-regulatory hormones, neuroglycopenia, autonomic symptoms? Or is it E, neuroglycopenia, autonomic and counter-regulatory hormones? So in which order does these responses occur when a patient is hypoglycemic? Correct answer is first counter-regulatory hormones, then the autonomic symptoms, and then the neuroglycopenic symptoms. So the counter hormone, uh, counter regulatory hormone release occurs at as uh, blood glucose as low well as 3.8 millimole per liter. These are the adrenaline and the glucagon which are released. 
Furthermore, if the blood glucose drops below 3.2 millimole per liter, the patients start experiencing autonomic symptoms, which are in the form of sweating, palpitation, shaking, and tremors. When the blood glucose goes further down to 2.7 millimole per liter and less, the patients start experiencing neuroglycopenic symptoms like confusion, drowsiness, speech difficulty, incoordination, and odd behavior. Occasionally, non specific symptoms like headache and nausea also occur. If the blood glucose goes down further less than 1.7, cardiac arrhythmias, cognitive dysfunction can happen, and less than 1.4 will be a state of coma. Less than 1.5 will be a state of uh, seizures or coma. So that's how the order happens, and uh, the symptoms appear as for the thresholds. Question number 30, we have a 34-year-old woman with a 21-year history of type 1 diabetes, has started treatment with septic insulin pump in the last one and a half year. Her HbA1c before pump was 77 uh, millimole per liter. Uh, don't concentrate on this number. This number seems to be wrong, 24 or so. 77, which is definitely very high. And she had experienced severe hypoglycemic events without warning symptoms over the previous four years. So maybe that was one of the reasons why the pump was put for this patient. At review in the clinic, she reported continuing episodes of severe hypoglycemia. She, she doesn't seem to have any benefit of putting the pump for her without warning symptoms, despite regular monitoring and advice for her insulin, uh, advice from her insulin pump nurse specialist. On examination, her blood pressure was 134 by 80, for endoscopy revealed moderate background diabetic retinopathy. Examination of her feet revealed strong palpable fetal pulses and an early evidence of sensory neuropathy. Her EGFR is low at 19. HbA1c is still suboptimal at 56, and she has definitely got proteinuria. So, what is the next appropriate step in the management of this patient? Should we change to back to injections? Should we refer for allogenic pancreas transplant? Should we refer for allogenic pancreatic islet cell transplant? Should we refer her for a combined pancreas and kidney transplant? And or should we just refer her for CGM? So the correct answer here is refer for combined pancreas and kidney transplantation. So these are the different forms of pancreatic transplantation. A donor pancreas may be used for endocrine replacement therapy in one of the following ways. PTA, which is pancreatic transplant alone. These are indicated for the patients with type 1 diabetes who have frequent episodes of hypoglycemia with or without unawareness, impaired quality of life, or other issues with insulin therapy tolerance. So she definitely needed a pancreatic transplant, but she also had an EGFR, which was pretty low. And that's why the ideal in her case scenario will be a simultaneous uh, or a combined pancreas and kidney transplantation as the option, as the two uh, SPK, which is described in this slide. Uh, what is pancreas after kidney transplant? This is the deceased donor pancreas transplantation after a previous kidney transplant has been done. Indication was similar to the PTA. What is pancreatic islet cell transplantation? This offers low mobility, but inferior in terms of long-term results compared with solid organ or whole pancreas transplantation. And that's the end of my free view. If you like to uh, listen to the full session, which is uh, up to 35, uh, so please subscribe to my lecture series. This is my lecture number 83. If you uh, subscribe to my lecture series, you'll get lifetime access to my existing 83 lectures, plus all my upcoming lectures in the uh, coming weeks and months leading up to your exam. So I wish you all, all the best for your exams. I know the uh, next attempt is coming up in November. And I wish you all the best. Exam lab questions, extremely important for your exams. Thank you so much.